Uh, that may be a section of a base installation of one or more feeders that can be isolated um, from the rest of the distribution, or it could be an entire base that can be completely isolated from the utility system. Uh, microgrid, by definition, is capable of independent operation from the remaining system. Therefore, if there are generation assets and loads within a, a microgrid boundary, they can either operate with or without the utility and the rest of the distribution system. It typically involves multiple generation assets and multiple loads. Now, you can look at things like the uh, uh, Ben's report or the MIT Lincoln Lab study that gives case studies on microgrids. And yes, you might consider a diesel generator tied to a building that can go into a backup power mode as a microgrid. You might even go as far as to say a laptop with a battery is a microgrid. Uh, but in, in, I guess, in our definition or for the context of our discussion today, a microgrid is a larger uh, distribution network um, that involves multiple generation assets and multiple loads. Lindsay, can you hear us okay? You're coming in loud and clear. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so what are some common features of a microgrid? Uh, ideally, you want to have seamless transition to and from a utility. But what that means is that if you know, for instance, the utility outage is coming or there's some instability in the utility and you want to go into an island in operation mode, you should be able to do so without taking a power outage. Uh, similarly, even if you don't know an outage is coming and you go into a microgrid configuration as a result of an unanticipated loss of utility, you don't want to take a second outage when you transition back from the microgrid to a standard utility uh, supply. So you want to be able to have a seamless transition back from microgrid to the utility. Uh, in the example of a building generator system, Obviously, when you lose power unexpectedly to a building, the generator comes on, but there's a, a small delay. Um, and typically, when the power comes back, there's another delay as that transfer switch switches back over to utility, unless it's a, a, a closed transition type transfer switch. But in a microgrid, ideally, you want to try to have it where we don't have those blips, or at least don't have those blips, um, other than an unanticipated utility outage. Uh, probably a very important um, aspect or feature of a microgrid as it pertains to the DOD is that you want to be able to integrate renewable assets and supportive loads without a utility presence. You may or may not be aware most utility or excuse me, most renewable assets, whether it's a PV array or a wind turbine, relies on a utility signal for a stable grid reference in order for it to put out power. So if the utility is lost in most cases, for instance, the two megawatt PV array that's at Fort Carson, if the utility is lost, even on a nice sunny day, that PV array cannot provide power to the installation. And the concurrent configuration will change that with the microgrid. And probably the last common feature of the microgrid is you do want a, certainly a higher level of automation than what exists in the typical distribution system on a military base today. It's not only automation, the ability to change and rebalance my loads and my generation, but also provide a lot more visibility to where my loads are, what my profiles look like within the microgrid itself, so that the system can make smart decisions on how to optimize the balance between load and generation aspects. Uh, brings us to the other aspect, which uh, in the industry, microgrids are getting thrown around as the neat new hip phrase. And a lot of people will try to take the word microgrid and apply it to a lot of things that it really isn't, and so there's a lot of confusion. And one of the things that uh, we run into is people who try to say that all you have to do to have a microgrid is throw more control at it. You can you know, add some neat new black box, and all of a sudden you have a microgrid. And, and that's usually not the case. It, it's very rare for somebody to have a system that, that can be a microgrid and just lacks the control to do it. Because if in that case, they could have had a, a manual only microgrid. And those do exist. So you already had the microgrid, you're just getting more controls with that type of solution. Another thing people get confused about is they think of microgrids as uninterruptible power. They're really not. You can have a UPS be a component of a microgrid, but the microgrid itself is not a source of UPS power. It's just a, a way of using uh, your different generation assets with different loads that are necessary. And finally, a lot of people will ask, what's the payback for microgrid? Well, there really isn't a payback for microgrid. The microgrid itself uh, can have assets that have payback in it. But the, it doesn't actually provide you a way of paying back at all. And that brings us to uh, the common assets that do have payback. Uh, first one is diesel generators. You know, a lot of people are so used to uh, putting diesel generators in, we forget that 
these two generators exist because they have a payback uh, analysis they can support. You can look at a cost of losing power and say, okay, if I lose power this frequently for this long, I can replace that with a diesel generator for this much cost, and there's a payback analysis you can do to justify that. Similarly, your PV arrays, wind, uh, any of the other renewable resources have a payback analysis that can be conducted. One that I like to you know, remind people of is that uh, control systems and electrical distribution do have a payback. Historically, it hasn't been very good, but like with the building management systems, as we've you know, integrated more and more microprocessors into the electrical systems, we're seeing advantages to the end user and ways of avoiding uh, maintenance and uh, be able to know more what happens in the system all the time. And so SCADA itself does have a payback. And finally, uh, combined heat and power is, is another resource that's commonly found in microgrids because usually if you go to the expense of putting in a combined heat and power plant, you'll also want to uh, tag on the capability of being a microgrid along with that. So like I said, you know, basically these are assets within the microgrid that, that have payback and uh, microgrid itself does not have payback. And so that brings up the question of you know, why would anyone actually do a microgrid? And it's real simple, it's energy security. That, that is the thing that microgrids do. They, they take these different assets that have different reasons for existing already on the, the facility or the base and tie them together in a way that gives you a greater energy security than you would have without the microgrid. And that's, that's basically what microgrids are all about. Okay. So now we'll talk a little bit some of the rationale or drivers behind the microgrid and, and maybe some of the initiatives within the DOD to provide microgrids and, and what were those drivers, what were those reasons. Uh, number one being, you know, military missions today, whether they're missions overseas or contingency operations, are really very reliant on stateside installations and the operations and missions supported within those for operations and logistics, you know, whether it be unmanned aerial vehicles or intelligence gathering or, or any of that communications network, you know, folks in, in Afghanistan rely on folks in the United States to actually support their daily activities. And I, and I think that's growing and continuing to grow as the force evolves. At the same time, these DOD installations have become almost totally reliant on the commercial U.S. power grid. And in many areas, especially if any of those of you on the, this call are from the northeast of the United States, you, you, we've seen that this uh, grid is increasingly fragile not only due to its age and in some, some areas its constraints its ability to, and its ability to provide more power to certain regions, but also just on susceptibility to storms um, and, and probably the biggest threat out there and it's been identified in the Defense Science Board report as well as the Quadrennial Defense Review that a cyber attack on our commercial grid would have a profound negative impact on our military operations. And that's really one of the primary drivers, at least behind the spiders microgrid uh, effort, is to try to uh, overcome the threat of a cyber attack on the commercial grid and be able to operate in a sustained islanded mode for a longer period of time. Uh, most diesel generators on, on buildings are put there, quite honestly, with the thought that we may lose utility power for an hour or two or maybe four or even eight. And sometimes fuel tanks are sized for as much as 72 hours of backup power. Um, but the reality is a building that's critical in a four-hour outage obviously is still critical after a four-week outage. But those buildings on an installation that were not deemed critical enough in their mission to require generators for what's expected to be a four-hour or eight-hour outage become more and more important after four days, two weeks, a month. Uh, I know there's instances of some installations in the Northeast where under the, after Hurricane Sandy, they were really without power um, for up to two weeks. Now, if those missions were supporting contingency operations overseas, that would have been a, a compromise to our national security. I'll talk a little bit about SPIDERS. SPIDERS, like all good DOD projects, is a, an acronym for a much more complicated name of the Smart Power Infrastructure Demonstration for Energy Reliability and Security. I'm not sure which came first, the acronym or the name, but it all works together pretty well. The uh, um, SPIDERS is what's called a, a Joint Capability Technology Demonstration, or JCTD, that really involves not only the Department of Defense, but the Department of Energy, the Department of Homeland Security, all kind of working in conjunction to develop 
really to push the envelope and further some uh, both R&D and MILCON objectives to design, build, um, integrate, and test uh, microgrids. So some of the JCTD objectives, kind of the overarching goal of SPIDERS is to provide a cyber secure microgrid for enhanced mission assurance. As I noted earlier, you know, a threat to a cyber threat to our commercial utility grid is disastrous to our military operations. Um, so we looked at a way to how can we in a, a secure, cyber secure, prolonged manner operate independent from the utility. There's other side benefits coming out of that mission assurance is it does increase reliability of backup power generation of those generation assets that we already have. We'll talk a little bit in detail about how we've done that at, at Fort Carson and, and uh, Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. Uh, reduces fossil fuel consumption of generators. Uh, it's not uncommon to find that a diesel generator was sized very conservatively for its load based on an assumption of either a peak load or even a future peak demand that building needs to serve. And under most operations or certainly over a average of a 24, 48 or multiple week operation, it runs at significantly less than its design load. Therefore, most generators are running at maybe you know, anywhere from 20 to 70 percent of what they're really designed to operate at which is actually at a less efficient point in its fuel consumption curve. So when we look at uh, SPIDER's configuration, we try to balance the fewest number of generators operating to serve the greatest number of loads in such a way that our fuel consumption is optimized. Uh, you know, not only does it save dollars and, and carbon and all those good environmental things, it also reduces the logistical burden on people that are operating the bases. They can spend less time worrying about how to get fuel to which generator day tank on a daily basis than they can about some of the other issues they're going to face in a prolonged utility outage. Um, another very significant aspect of spiders is integration of renewable generation when you're in islanded mode. So we talked about Fort Carson has a two megawatt PV array. Uh, there's initiatives in the Army in particular and the DOD globally to add significant levels of renewables, trying to get up to one gigawatt of generation coming from renewables in each one of the, the services. Uh, Fort Bliss, for example, has a 20 megawatt array planned to come online soon. Uh, the, the downfall of those is that although they provide great value and reduce operating costs during the 99 plus percent of the time you're tied to the utility, for that 1% of the time or less that you're down from the utility, that PV array is a stranded asset providing no value when you really need it the most. So by hooking it into a micro configuration, we can take advantage of that. And obviously, because we're last point because we are concerned about a cyber attack on the utility, we need to make sure that our control system for our microgrid is not susceptible to the same attack that the utility is. So we need to have a much more cyber secure industrial control system to support the microgrid so that we are more uh, robust and, and resilient from attack. Talk a little bit about the spiders JCTD overall. Um, and I apologize here, some of the slides started to uh, reformat a little bit when we went to the webinar version, and so I blocked out a few, uh, every once in a while you see some text blocked out here and there. What you'll see is, is SPIDERS is really a three phase plus approach. Phase one is to do a smaller scale, um, circuit, single circuit level demonstration at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. Uh, phase two is to do a larger scale, multiple buildings, multiple generators, larger scale renewable at Fort Carson. Phase three, which is coming up soon, is actually to take an entire military installation, and then it's Camp Smith uh, in Hawaii, the Marine Corps base, to in make the entire base a microgrid. In addition to just a microgrid from a backup power standpoint, we're looking at other services to help try to offset some of that cost, put a return on investment of some of those assets in the microgrid by doing grid services, trying to do things like peak shaving, um, demand response, other types of things that can help offset some of the the cost by reducing utility costs. And then finally, the transition, which is currently being managed by the Navy, uh, NAFAC out of Port Wanini, is looking at how do we take what we learned in those three phases, which are kind of considered uh, phase one being the, the crawl phase, phase two being the walk phase, and phase three being the run phase of the program, how do you transition that to the DOD as a whole? A few things we, we've considered uh, as an integrator. Um, when we looked at, at uh, bidding the work at Pearl Harbor and, and at Fort Carson, is you know, not only do we want to meet all the objectives of the JCTD, we really need to do so by minimizing changes to existing infrastructure. 
It's really for a couple reasons. Um, number one, we have people that know how to operate our current backup power and distribution systems very well. We don't want to come in and change their paradigm and their daily work and create a whole new set of uh, you know, new advanced uh, stage devices that they now have, need to learn and understand how to operate. Um, plus, it's just cost prohibitive. There's no way you could go to an entire base and change the whole electrical distribution system to build a microgrid without taking advantage of some existing assets. You'd never be able to do it for two reasons, not only cost, but no one can afford to take a critical mission down for three months to reconstruct all the electrical distribution systems. So those are some things we had to consider um, during construction and testing. How do we minimize the disruption to ongoing operations? And in most cases, that means utilize existing assets to the greatest extent possible. So within the spider's uh, overall philosophy, Basically, our, our first goal was we're trying to, by creating the microgrid, we're decoupling our generators from their loads. In the current configuration of most facilities, they have a, a dedicated generator serving a fixed load the, through a transfer switch or two or three transfer switches. Spiders allows us to use the existing distribution system within the base to take the generator and serve not only the load that it currently has, but also other loads within that distribution network. So that, that allows us to do two things. First, we can uh, give ourselves redundancy by having two or three generators operating together to serve loads. And if one generator goes out, we still have uh, spare capacity in the other generators. But also, it allows us to take uh, facilities that don't have generators now and provide them with generator power during an extended outage. Like we talked about before, if you have an outage that goes two or three weeks, there are some other buildings on uh, the site that will suddenly become very, very important to everyone. So this gives the uh, commander of the base, the ability to direct power of where it best suits his uh, mission as it evolves. The second piece we do is we integrate a new isolated control system. And within that system, we're using a, a cyber secure uh, transmission network that meets the DOD requirements. Now, the downside of the DOD requirements is that they have so much overhead with transmitting any, any signals that something like a microgrid where everything has to respond immediately, you have to make sure you have the ability to handle that. And so basically, what we've been doing is we create an, an overarching control system that talks to all of the isolated control systems that already exist within the uh, different facilities and gets them to work together in concert. And uh, finally, we want to be able to, again, capture every generation asset. We don't discriminate between diesels and non-diesels in the system. We, we think of every generator as a, a potential source of power for the facility. So we want to go after all the renewable assets. We want the PV. We want the wind. Uh, and we'll show later, we're even going after electric vehicles now. You know, we want to make sure that if, if the base needs power, they have every asset available to them. And here's an example from uh, what we found at uh, phase one at Pearl Harbor. Basically, we had two generators in that system, an 800 kW and a 1600 kW generator. And uh, basically, they were loaded about a quarter of what their real capacity was. So. Uh, Basically, these operating points show where they were on their curves. And the, the chart you're seeing as you go, the vertical axis is the rate of fuel consumption, and the horizontal axis is load. So as the load increases, the fuel consumption increases. And as you can see, they're both operating very low on their uh, capacity curves. So what we can do is uh, these two generators were operating independent of one another. And we wanted to time together. So we want to look at what the combined uh, load would be with, with both generators. So we take the load and we move it up and stack it. So we basically have a condition where we can operate it, uh, the two generators independently using the fuel we have, which totals up to the top of the arrow we're on now. Or we can switch over to either of the two generators carrying the load. And then you can see where the new operating point would be. No matter which generator we pick, we're definitely uh, saving fuel, but the better fuel consumption savings is definitely to go with a smaller generator, which is you know, intuitive because the smaller the uh, generator or the more closely it matches its load, the more efficient it will inherently be. So basically what we found when we've been doing the spiders uh, projects is there is a very good value proposition to not only microgrids, as we talked about with just energy security in general, but the spider solution to microgrids. Uh, the first thing for spiders is it is very focused on repurposing existing assets. We're not coming in and buying a whole bunch of new generators to make this work. We don't have to buy any kind of special uh, PV arrays. You know, all the stuff that's already been installed, we're, we're, our focus is work with that as much as possible. 
Um, you know, there's lots of advantages to that, but the, the biggest thing for us is from a maintenance uh, and reliability standpoint, those assets are proven technology. We're not talking about being out on the bleeding edge with some new concept that there's been two of them ever made type thing. These are things that are in operation everywhere and, and people can uh, you know, take care of it and have faith in it, in it to actually work. The second piece of uh, spiders is we're focused on flexibility. We're, we're not saying you have to go into the microgrid. We're giving the option of going to the microgrid or staying where you are. <coughs> the other piece of that is um, instead of forcing you to be in the microgrid, the ability to stay where you are allows us to satisfy all the life safety codes because the default operation of a spider's microgrid is exactly like it was before we got there. The you know power goes out, the generator starts, transfer, transfer switch flips over. It, it's the normal thing everyone's ready for. It's after you've decided this is a prolonged outage that's worth going to the next level of, of operation that you can uh, decide to go in either automatically or manually and say let's enter the microgrid and then we switch modes of operation over to that. And so that gives you a lot of flexibility. One of the unexpected uh, benefits of this also has been that we've been able to change the way the generators are tested. And we're now able to test generators at their full capacity uh, by actually connecting the generators to the real grid instead of only the microgrid. So it's another interesting uh, side benefit we've had. Right. We found, we found that in some uh, cases, like at Pearl Harbor, the generators are often tested at off-peak times in order to not disrupt the operations. And so a generator, uh, we found this at Pearl Harbor and Fort Carson, as a matter of fact, the generators under testing never saw more than 20% of their design load. Well, that's because it, it only took the load of the transfer switch at a non-peak time. By hooking up to a microgrid, we can actually dial in whatever test load we want to test these generators at because I'm running it in parallel to the grid. So, for instance, at, at Pearl Harbor, we had 2.4 megawatts worth of generators. We actually carried the load during the test plus exported over a megawatt worth of power to the grid on, on the base. And what that really does is reduces the meter uh, spinning on the base. So theoretically, if you test your generators at you know 4 o'clock on a August hot afternoon, you might actually reduce your demand charges um, if I run the generators for a certain period of time by reducing the peak uh, draw for the base. I mean, rather than bringing in a, a load bank, for example, to try to test a generator at full load, which is just completely wasted heat and additional cost, now I can test it and actually gain a benefit as well as increased flexibility in my testing procedures. Uh, the other benefit is you can test it without taking an outage to the load uh, that, that's uh, serving the uh, generator serving, which today, uh, every time you do test a generator, it's going to have a blip in the building it's serving. Um, some other aspects of the value proposition of spiders, because we need to add not only a control network for the microgrid, but a cyber secure control network, it uh, does increase situational awareness within the installation. For example, at Pearl Harbor, um, even though now it's a joint base, the utilities operators for NAVPAC only had visibility to the SCADA system at the old Pearl Harbor side of the base. On the Hickam side, there was absolutely no SCADA, no visibility into the distribution. Well, because we were adding microgrid controllers to a portion of some of the feeders on the Hickam side and, and provided connectivity back to the overall Pearl Harbor Utility Command Center, they now had additional visibility as to what was happening with their loads on the, on the Hickam side. Um, so one thing we try to do to make sure that it's cyber secure is where existing assets have um, an appropriate level of control, for example, a generator control with a Woodward generator controller on it, we utilize that control at one level, and we only add controls at a higher level that monitors any existing control networks and then provides you know, commands to change the settings on those control networks. That has two benefits. Number one, it utilizes existing control interfaces where they exist, um, but it also provides multiple layers of control or enclaves from a cyber secure perspective which means that if one particular level was vulnerable to uh, an intrusion, um, it doesn't necessarily make it vulnerable to the entire network from an intrusion. We also get a distributed controls philosophy. Um, there's some benefits there, but the number one being I don't have one single head-end control system that everything else relies on, and if that either fails or is attacked, uh, whether a physical attack or a cyber attack, I've lost all my control. 
look at a distributed control network where, in theory, any one controller in the network can kind of take command and run the whole network um, in the absence of any one of the other controllers. That's how to look at a, a COTS or commercial off-the-shelf based solution. Again, we don't want to, to generate new, um, you know, first-of-a-kind equipment uh, that's never been tested for a prolonged period of time and rely on it to run a, a highly reliable power system. If we try to use commercial off-the-shelf equipment uh, for uh, the individual control components um, and other aspects of the system, um, just so that it is proven technology and also it's easier to maintain. Um, for example, uh, just for consistency, we, we are using a certain set of Basler type relays in part of our control network at Pearl Harbor because some of their substations had Basler relays. When we go to Fort Carson, they use Schweitzer relays in certain parts of their distribution system, so we modified that to a Schweitzer network. Uh, again, you know, the key is to be flexible and to try to match or utilize existing installation infrastructure to the extent possible. Now we'll talk a little bit more about phase one in particular at Pearl Harbor. Uh, to get an idea, um, the, the critical load defined for Pearl Harbor was the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, recognized not the uh, uh, best photo opportunity for, for a presentation, but uh, the, the wastewater treatment plant is critical to the operation of both sides of the Pearl Harbor and the Hickam side. Um, you can see down at the bottom of the picture there, that was a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, roughly a quarter mile or half mile to the north, you'll see a, a box called the Renewable Island. That's essentially where the interface equipment was, the inverters, uh, motor control center. They connected to an existing 150 kW PV array, uh, connected to a flow battery that was being installed under another project, and also connected to um, uh, some uh, uh, breakers that would connect into future wind turbines. You can see at the very far north end, there's Mamala substation, which is where the feeder originated from. So the circuit coming out of Mamala you know, picks up the renewables as well as feeds the entire wastewater treatment plant. And for those of you familiar with the uh, installation, also uh, parallel feeders go down and feed the Air National Guard for Hawaii down further down the road. All right, the, the, the load, as we mentioned, Pearl Harbor was a bit of a crawl, and the crawl walk one approach. So it serves a relatively small load. It averaged about 500 kW with a realistic range of 400 to 700 kW of critical load. There was, there's two existing electrically isolated generators in their respective buses, 150 kW PV array. Um, a 1600 kW generator, which as I mentioned was generally underloaded with only a 400 kW load most days, and an 800 kW generator that only saw roughly 100 kW worth of load. So you can see either one of those generators was more than capable of carrying the entire load of the wastewater treatment plant, but because of the electrical configuration, they were isolated. So if one generator failed, in essence, the whole wastewater treatment plant went down because I couldn't operate with just parts of the processes running. I needed both of them to run, so I had no additional reliability um, in my generation scheme. A little more of the details of where some of the uh, PV array was. And here's the one line of the system. Uh, again, this is very, you know, cartoonish and a simplified one line. But essentially, we took a single feeder from the substation, the Mamala substation, used the 15 kV distribution network, run down and tied in the renewable island, which, as I mentioned, was a PV array and, and a flow battery and some other equipment, um, went to transfer switches to pick up the two generators, which then in turn served each of their individual loads. Now, one thing we did with the transfer switches, we didn't replace them, what we added was what we called a bypass breaker, a spider's breaker, to essentially utilize the transfer switch the way it's meant to be utilized today, but providing the extra flexibility to parallel the power across both the normal and emergency sides of that transfer switch, so any generator can not only serve its load, but can also in parallel feed the entire distribution network. Therefore, I can have a situation where either generator can feed either load, either individually or in parallel, essentially creating an N plus 1 redundancy in my generator system that did not exist. And the further benefit is by utilizing the generators to not only serve at the 480 volt level, but also energize the 15 kV level, any renewables that are hooked up to that 15 kV circuit, you know, based on their um, preconditioned control interface on the inverters, in all intents and purposes, believe the utilities back and then will allow those inverters to put power back into the system. So not only am I saving fuel by picking the most efficient generator to balance with the load I'm seeing at that point in time, 
but I'm also further reducing my fuel consumption because I'm allowing the renewables to offset some of that load as well and reduce my generation even further. So one of the uh, unique pieces of this project that we knew this was the, the crawl stage and looking forward to the future phases of uh, spiders, we knew one of the issues that would have to be overcome is how do you get dis very distant generators to work together on a common generation bus? You know, typically parallel generation assets want to be really close together and they have, you know, nice copper wires connecting between their controllers so they talk very fast and keep in balance with one another. So uh, because we had the option on phase one to just go ahead and do it the easy way, the generators were physically, you know, about 50 feet apart, we're like, well, that, that would be okay, but we want to, you know, help contribute to the future of the project and, and try to overcome a couple obstacles while there's no downside to, if we can't get it to work right. And so we intentionally took these two generators and sent a uh, parallel uh, load shedding or load sharing signal over as far a distance as we could. So we actually sent the signal all the way back to the Malala substation and then back to the other generator. And basically by doing that via fiber optic cable for the first time, uh, we were able to prove that technology. And you know, like I said, if it hadn't worked, we had an easy out, but it worked exactly as built. You know, it was amazing. Even the um, manufacturers involved were amazed that it worked, uh, it, you know, just basically out of the box came together. So that was a, a great, accomplishment for the phase one project, which helps us when we look forward to the other phases. So we get to uh, basically the, the phase one, what all got demonstrated as part of that uh, piece of the uh, project. First thing was we did demonstrate that we can actually operate the microgrid on its own and then also putting uh, a PV asset in the system. During the uh, testing of the system, we actually were able to forcibly put it into a configuration that was abnormal for it where we actually generated 90% of the load uh, from our PV array. So we had 90% uh, on PV, the remaining 10% was made up by our diesel generator, and uh, it created a very unusual operating uh, condition for the generator because it was operating very, very, very lightly loaded and at a very unusual power factor because it was providing all the reactive power to the entire system, but it was extremely stable in operating condition and uh, the PV array was you know, completely unfazed by it. So, we operated like that for quite a while and, and found it to be a, a successful test. As a point of reference, most facilities won't operate at more than 10 to 15 percent renewables in a distribution system. Because they're worried about stability, but because the generator is really a very responsive, reactive. Hey guys, sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing whoever is speaking. Can you repeat that last? I guess the point we're trying to make is, you know, Eric said we were able to test up to 90% PV penetration on the, the small circuit. As a point of reference, most utilities on anything utility scale and renewables will limit the renewables to 10 to 15% of the total load because they're worried about maintaining a stable grid with anything higher than 50% renewable penetration. The, because we're using diesel generators on site, you know, it kind of speaks to the responsiveness and reactiveness uh, capability of a diesel generator. And, and you know, although people uh, may shy away from burning fossil fuels in a generator, it's really a very stable, um, effective piece of equipment in keeping a microgrid reliable and it allows us to get to that higher level of penetration, whereas there's too much uh, momentum in a broader utility scale and the generation is too far away to react quick enough to do it at a utility level, anything much higher than 15% PV penetration. And as I mentioned before, we uh, were able to demonstrate the transmission of the load sharing uh, signals. The other piece we were able to do is we actually uh, had the control system follow through all of the uh, procedures of a full diacap system. And as far as we know, that's the first time it's been done in a microgrid environment. It, uh, actually even went so far after the uh, project was completed, the government went back with a red team and attacked the system to further reinforce how uh, strongly it had been uh, protected. It was a very successful test. Uh, the other pieces we've talked about before where we uh, are able to demonstrate that the failure of the control system does just revert us back to the system that's already in place. We uh, demonstrated that in several different ways during the uh, testing program. Uh, we also demonstrated, uh, as we talked about before, the enhanced ability to uh, test the generators in a variety of conditions and in a way that they hadn't seen before. So in 
was very, very well received once they saw how that uh, worked out. And of course, the, the real uh, key grabber for everyone was we went for a 72-hour test, and this was done independently. We had the uh, national labs run a test, and then we also did our own testing. And we both came to about the same conclusion, that it's approximately a 30% reduction in diesel fuel uh, by using a spider's approach. Uh, that savings is from a, a couple different factors. First of all, uh, we were running, as I talked about before, on the smaller generator, the 800 kW generator. Well, that's the optimum size generator for this system. So that saved us a significant amount of fuel. It also happened to be the newest generator. The 1600 kW generator was a very old technology. So just moving to a new generator saved us fuel. And then finally, we were able to save fuel by uh, picking up the PV during the days. And this 30% reduction, that's 30% over a 72-hour period, not 30% from you know, noon to 5 on a nice sunny day. So during the day, we were saving a great deal of fuel. And then at night, we were just running strictly on the, the diesel. And uh, here's some of our uh, performance data. Basically, what you're seeing is the top line is the total uh, power consumption of the wastewater treatment plant. The bottom line is the solar production from our PV array. Uh, this is four days worth of data. You can see the, the four peaks for the solar. Uh, the second line down from the top is showing the um, actual fuel consumption if we had run the system <clears throat> in its traditional mode. Uh, both generators running, carrying only their load. The line below that is the uh, fuel consumption by using the optimum size generator and utilizing the PV. And you'll you know, obviously it's a lower uh, line, so it's saving fuel. But there's two different reasons why we save fuel. The first one is we optimize the generation, so that's the big gap between the lines that's fairly consistent all the way across. And then the second piece is each of the valleys that corresponds to the uh, PV production is where we all also were able to offset fuel consumption uh, during the uh, day periods. So that, that gives a little uh, summary of, of the uh, spiders phase one at Pearl Harbor. Uh, that project is construction's complete, testing's complete, and it's been handed over to the Navy to continue to use as they see fit. Now we'll talk a little bit about spiders phase two at Fort Carson, which is the you know, walk phase of the, uh, of the JCTD. Um, this one's a little bit bigger microgrid, and again, I apologize for some of the uh, font sizes that got changed in the webinar version, but um, it essentially serves multiple buildings, uh, some considered tier one, some tier two, and some tier three loads, which means how critical are they to the mission of the base. Uh, it's roughly a two megawatt total, total load. It integrates existing generation. Um, several buildings, say we've got 10 buildings on the microgrid, uh, six of them had generators, and the other four did not. But because of optimizing the selection of which generators and, and, and matching them with the load, we only need to take three of the, the three largest generators and hook them into the uh, microgrid so that in, in backup power mode, I don't have to worry about providing fuel and replacing fuel for the three smaller generators. I'm only providing fuel for the three largest generators. And those can carry the entire load of the 10 buildings on the microgrid. Um, there's also a much larger scale PV array. It's a two megawatt PV array um, that's on the base. And there's a few other very uh, cut, I'd say here's where some of the cutting edge uh, technology comes in. We're also using bi-directional uh, plug-in electric vehicle charging. So the, the base actually has acquired five you know, fairly large uh, you know, buses, utility truck type electric vehicles that obviously have a battery capacity that can store energy as well as provide a drive power for the vehicles. Um, we're actually taking those and treating them as batteries in the system to help shave peaks and put power back onto the grid when we're in backup power mode. We're also using the inverters on those battery chargers to provide some grid services, actually look at um, simulating market conditions where could they export power to do peak shaving um, or to do volt bar optimization or some other service that the utility may actually pay for and help offset some of the cost. And one of the big things we found at Fort Carson uh, the big benefits of adding these bi-directional chargers is we can also configure them to do power factor correction. Uh, say, for example, the local utility, it wants to distribute and sell power at a 0.95 power factor. But the base is using something closer to 0.85 due to the nature and the load profile of their motors and other things on the base. So that difference from 0.95 to 0.85 is essentially being assessed a penalty 
to Fort Carson that they're paying on the utility bill. So regardless of how much power they're consuming, they're paying a, a penalty because their demand is at such a low power factor that somewhere in the area of one cent a kilowatt hour, um, sometimes higher, which is becoming a you know significant, uh, greater than 10 percent portion of their utility bill. Well, we're actually able to put some, uh, through the use of the uh, electrical technology, actually change some of the power factor through use of these to actually, um, uh, for lack of a better word, absorb or add some bars to the system so that we're um, allowing the power being supplied by the utility to come in at a higher, po higher power factor. Um, this is really significant because as the Army adds large-scale PV arrays, it actually hurts the power factor required from the utility because most PV arrays or wind or any other inverter-based technology under current UL listings is putting out a, a unity power factor onto the grid. So what that means is if I'm supplying a significant amount of load from my base with the unity power factor, that means the power I need to buy from the utility has to be at even a lower power factor so that the average, for lack of a better word, matches the load profile of the base. So every time you add PV, you may be saving dollars in kilowatt hours, but you may be adding dollars back onto your bill in power factor correction. And those are some things we can correct through, not only through these electrical vehicle chargers, but maybe buying inverters a different way when you add PV onto your system. Fort Carson micro, it's a little bit bigger. Uh, if any of you have been there, uh, we're, we're imposing it on a fairly large section of Specker Avenue, which is a high density portion of the installation. And the PV array you can see is, is really a mile down the road, quite a bit further down the road. So there's quite a bit of uh, to, uh, distance between the loads and the PV array that's connecting to the microgrid. Uh, here's kind of a schematic, again, that shows some of the buildings um, on the microgrid. Uh, the, the red boxes are, are different building numbers. You can see that three of them, building 1435, 1550, and 1551, um, utilize their generators, whereas, for instance, 2435 that has a generator, we don't need to use in the microgrid. There's a few other buildings that we don't need to use the generators either. So, you know, overall, just in this example, this small segment, there are seven buildings, but we're actually powering all of them through the use of three generators on three existing buildings. And that's with redundancy, so I only really need two generators, but the third one is an N plus one redundant generator. I would just kind of go kind of give you the higher level of where we're at on the SPIDERS program. We'll talk about just some, you know, last few points on just general things to consider as the DOD rolls out and some of its initiatives on renewables and other energy security. Well, uh, as uh, we've mentioned before, the, the typical PV arrays and uh, wind turbines and different inverter-based technologies that are out there because of the UL listing and the utility requirements within the United States, they're producing power at unity power factor, and they're very, very sensitive to uh, tripping offline due to grid instability. It, it's a safety factor for the workers on the line, so they don't have to worry about the equipment forming a power island and a, a lineman going up on a pole thinking it's dead because it's cut off from the utility, and all of a sudden he finds out that it's energized by, from the PV array at, at the person's house. Because of those uh, conditions, when you use a uh, PV or any other inverter technology in a microgrid, you have to be very cognizant of the fact that the uh, system, if it has a voltage or uh, frequency instability for any amount of time, it's going to lose that asset very quickly, you know, in a matter of cycles. And so uh, we're very big on keeping a spinning reserve on hand all the time in order to uh, compensate for that potential because if you have a system that has uh, one or two large compressors start at the same time in a building or something, that can cause enough disturbance to knock the PV out for a little bit. Uh, the other piece is, as Dave mentioned earlier, the unity power factor and how we need to be able to make sure that the system can accommodate the necessary VARs that have to be created. Again, the spinning reserve approach addresses that concern uh, very nicely. I'll see that kind of text box at the bottom, and, and don't pay attention to the text. The, the only point there was that's actually an excerpt from the Huntsville's um, a seven billion dollar uh, renewable power purchase agreement contract. That's an excerpt from the performance work statement that actually talks about how would these renewables potentially be tied to, um, you know, grid isolation technology such as a microgrid and existing on-site generation assets. And we just point that out because some of these things really need to be considered carefully 
when before you go and add a large PV array or any other renewable to a base, you know, look at how it can be utilized better for for you know power factor correction, grid stability, microgrid, other applications beyond just uh, providing a renewable source to offset my utility bill. And going for, uh, further with the PPA considerations, uh, basically the, the pieces you need to keep in mind when looking at the PPAs for PV especially, because that's so prevalent now in the military bases, is uh, first of all, if you, you know, Dave and I are big fans of the microgrid concept and energy security, and so we think all the PPAs should include the capability of using a PV array as an asset within a microgrid. And so you need to address that up front with the owner of the asset and they'll say, you know, first of all, we want to have access to what you have. We want to make sure that we have the you know, proper ownership documents in place, the, the different agreements on how we can access it, and, and even more importantly, the communications interface to allow that access to happen. You know, when you're negotiating it, it's not a big deal to these guys to do that. It's a little bit more of a headache later on because then they have to bring in all their lawyers and and it becomes a, you know, one of those things, why should I do that for you? It's not really getting me that much more because all you're going to do is buy a little bit of my power and those few times where you don't have uh, the utility available. So it's, it's not so much of a benefit for them in that respect. The other piece to look at is the, the size of the PV array itself. And that's in two pieces. First, the, the total array, but also the inverters within the array. Ideally, for a microgrid, you want to take the, the arrays and keep them size similar to the size of the equipment that's around them. Don't put all of your PV for an entire uh, installation in one corner of the installation and then try to use it as part of a microgrid because it's just too large of an asset. When you start talking about, you know, multiple megawatts of PV into a, a system that is, you know, normally running around two or three megawatts, it, it's very challenging to get that to work and balance out properly and to be efficiently used. And then the second piece is within the array, you have multiple inverters. If you can use inverters that are uh, you know, of differing sizes so that you can uh, optimize which one you're using at different conditions. That can also be a great benefit to uh, the system. And then the other piece we'd like to talk about is the, the changes in the military's approach to uh, microgrids and be able to prepare for them because, again, we see the, the microgrid solution as being a very nice solution for the military to be able to address the instability in the national grid. And so we would like to see all the uh, New generator installations, you know, at like 500 kW and larger generators, consider the installation of a spider's breaker, and that's again a breaker that allows the generator to be connected directly to the grid. That gives a, a, a lot of advantages we talked about uh, earlier, but um, it also gives you that flexibility down the road. Even if you're not creating a microgrid, if you have that breaker available, you can do immediate return on investment through uh, peak shaving and the testing aspects of it, and in the long term, you have that energy security. We also think that uh, in this condition, the automatic transfer switch associated with that generator should be a closed transition type. That allows for seamless transitions back and forth no matter what situation occurs. And then uh, one of the things we've run into on Army bases where they use lots of the uh, SNC PMH style sectionalizing switches is uh, to automate those switches, you have to actually raise them up and put them on a foundation. It would be uh, great if all those switches are being installed now even if they're not being set up for automation, that there is definitely sufficient slack in the cables to allow that uh, future change up to happen. And if at all possible, uh, high-speed breakers should be introduced into systems wherever you think microgrids would tie together or tie to the utility. With that, that that's the end of it. Uh, Lindsay, hey, I guess we went a little bit longer than I thought, so we, have, we still have some time for questions. And it's incredibly informative, and I really like that you went through the technicalities of it before kind of providing the illustrative examples. Um, so far, I've got one question, and I think you kind of covered it in the last few slides, but uh, maybe it's important enough to go over again. Um, the question says that if microgrid is relying on diesel power generation to produce part of the electricity of its system, how do you think that microgrids are actually helping to the Clean Energy Act knowing that those motors are still polluting the air? So I guess the question is kind of, A, is it possible to link it up on all renewables? And then B, how are microgrids actually helping to offset the diesel generation of gases um, with PV arrays and other renewable energy? Okay. Uh, Lindsay, you Okay, well, well, I guess I'll give you my, I hope I can say it's an answer, maybe more of an opinion, but um, there is a technical answer part of it too. You know, 
could a entirely renewable generation source supply power to a base? Um, possibly if that renewable generation is geothermal uh, or something that's a little bit more reliable than the sun and the wind, um, or if there was a significant amount of battery storage or some other type of energy storage that you can accommodate for the fact that you know the sun's only there so many hours a day and some days not very much at all and the wind is, is hard to predict. Um, you, know, you could do you could do it that way um, to get to net zero, but quite honestly, it's going to be very challenging. In reality, net zero is going to mean that there'll be times a day when I export power and times a day when I import power, but the average is going to be I get to a net zero balance over the light, you know, course of a year. Um, but, but one thing to keep in mind is with these generators, and it doesn't have to be diesel generators. It could be a natural gas-fired combined heat and power plant or any other. It could be a biofuel combined heat and power plant or a biofuel or biodiesel power generator. Um, but, but the point about a generator is you need something that's reliable regardless of the weather condition that I can control and respond fast enough. Because say I have a 20 megawatt PV array for a 20 megawatt load on the base and I'm using it in the middle of the afternoon but a cloud comes over. That 20 megawatts can drop to five megawatts in a matter of seconds. Well, I need something that can respond quick enough so that I don't drop loads in the buildings. So any kind of what we call spinning reserve, and, and in, theoretically it can be done with batteries, but the technology is not there to be a cost-effective solution yet at that scale. Um, you, I need something that can re ramp up quickly to respond to that quick downturn in the output of another renewable. And finally, I have to keep in mind from an environmental uh, benefit standpoint is the intent of spiders is really to provide a better means of backup power. Uh, and keep in mind, we're using, you know, going into installations where they're already using generators running on fuel of some sort, and most likely diesel, to provide that backup power. They're just doing it inefficiently. And so, you know, today if I had five generators serving five buildings and they're all running at a 50% loaded, they're running at a pretty inefficient point in their curve, which means I'm burning more fuel and emitting more pollutants into the air. If I go into a microgrid and better balance the generation capability with the load, I may drop those five generators down to two running at any given time, and they're running at a much more efficient point. So that 30% fuel savings we showed could be as much as 50% fuel savings if I have a higher level of PV, and that obviously means 50% less fuel consumed means 50% less emissions dumped into the air. And, and one thing I would also add is the uh, data we showed was from the uh, Pearl Harbor project, which is our uh, phase one. In phase two, uh, we're going to have a significantly larger uh, penetration of PV, and so the, the savings will be very dramatic on, on phase two. You know, basically on phase one, our uh, PV array was about one-fourth the size of our total load. And in phase two, our PV array is actually larger than what we anticipate our normal load to be during the day. So uh, the, the savings will, will definitely be there when you see uh, the results on, uh, on the Fort Carson piece. And then also, again, it, it's, we're not getting to a perfect solution, but we're getting a long way down the road towards that solution. And I think that's the, the beauty of Spires is, again, we're not spending a lot of money to prove something that's not practical yet. We're, you know, gaining really the great, uh, benefits. Answer. Um, and cost I think you guys some good points in there. Um, I have a few more questions, if we have time. Um, one is, does the spider configuration induce more frequent changes slash adjustments of loads to individual generation and control assets that would cause increased wear or more frequent maintenance or replacement schedules? No, it, it actually in some ways benefits the generators. Uh, based on what we've seen so far in the different uh, facilities we've looked at, the generators are so lightly loaded that they're actually being hurt by that. Uh, diesel generators suffer from a concept called wet stacking. And, uh, you know, we have generators that are running for years so lightly loaded that they, they're experiencing that. And getting a generator up more towards its optimal uh, rating is better for it. It, it actually is a, a happier generator, if you will. And so uh, that's another one of the benefits of the spiders is that we see long term it's a, a lower maintenance uh, event because you're able to properly test your generators, you're pro able to run them more optimally, and you're running fewer generators, so you reduce the total generation. Yeah, it, it's basically like the difference between running uh, two more um, questions, miles and city miles getting on your more. Uh, it, it's so 
what is the long-term impact of diesel running at such a low load? I think you kind of covered that, but is there anything additional you want to add? No, just okay. the, again, it, it's the wet stacking phenomenon, and it, it is detrimental to generators. But also through wet stacking, it really means it's not efficiently burning the fuel. So it's really not only ah, hurting the exhaust system, that's a really good point. the generator, it's actually polluting uh, okay, more than it would have been ran as we wrap that's up, uh, how is the effort being tied to the previous direct current discussions, if at all? Uh, at this point, Spiders is not uh, looking at direct current solutions. Again, uh, we're trying to optimize with all the existing assets, and at the military bases right now, it, it's very, very predominant uh, AC generation. So uh, Spiders is, is, at this time, an AC solution. However, Spiders is flexible. We can take the same concept and apply it to DC, and in some ways, the DC solution is almost a trivial solution when you get into Spiders because of the way that I think a tag uh, on to that might works. be... Um, something recent, I think we discussed this when you guys came in and, and did your presentation, is that we had kind of upset, uh, I think it was at Aberdeen with Hurricane Sandy, and that we had a large PV with the idea that that would be focused on redundancy um, of the power infrastructure, and then when the hurricane came in and knocked out the power, we found out that, well, actually, because the solar panels are running off of, are running and providing DC current, that they then get tied in to the power provider who is responsible for inverting it um, that's not the right word, but uh, converting it to AC power and giving it back to the base. So what happened was when Sandy came in and knocked out the power infrastructure, the power supplier, that meant that they didn't have any way to convert it and all their power was down. Well, that gives back to what we talked about with the, the PPAs. Unfortunately, some of the bases are set up on PPAs where they're actually putting their PV directly to the utility and basically using that as an offset within their bill. If that happens um, in that condition, it's very difficult to get that PV to where it's available as an energy security asset because the utility doesn't want to allow you to use their wires to energize the system. On the flip side, if you look at uh, Fort Carson or Pearl Harbor or some of the other facilities where they've got the PV, uh, if you will, behind the meter, then in that condition, Spiders is the perfect solution for that. That's, that's really our driving uh, proposition is that we provide that uh, grid reference signal. It doesn't, the PV doesn't care if it's a utility grid or a microgrid that's powering it. Once it sees a stable signal long enough, it'll start producing power. And, and that's one of the really neat things about Spiders is we're able to get these otherwise stranded assets and make perfect. them available well, to the Great presentation. Base. And I'll add for those that of you that are interested, I, I don't think I mentioned that in the middle box on the left-hand side, you can right-click and download their presentation. But as always, these are recorded, and we'll have this YouTube video up towards the end of the week on our sustainability and energy website. So David and Eric, again, thank you so much for doing the presentation. We really appreciate it, and thank you for your time.